again, in Romans 8, 28 through 30, this text discusses the theological background of our calling uh, quite well. And so starting in verse 28, Paul says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. And so Romans 8 describes this series of events. God predestined certain individuals to become conformed to the image of his Son, but before he predestined them, he foreknew them, or that's what the order of the text seems to indicate. However, it is important to not associate foreknowledge solely with omniscience, because foreknew comes from prognosco, which means to know beforehand. But a common interpretation of verse 29 is that God knew ahead of time who would believe on Christ, and then he predestined that those people would be conformed to the image of his Son. Inherent in this interpretation is that the belief on Christ was not God's doing, but was left entirely up to those individuals' will. Therefore, God predestined the salvation of those who would believe on Christ, but God did not predestine the belief of those who would believe on Christ. And this is, in my estimation, an incorrect interpretation mainly because that is not actually what the text says. The text does not say that those whom God foreknew would believe on Christ, he predestined. Instead, it says, those whom God foreknew, he predestined. And it is vital that we do not add words to text, because nowhere in this text does it say that God's foreknowledge was based on anything, yet alone on the choice of man or woman. What the text says is that God predestined those he foreknew. This is also in line with the subject of the called that we've just been talking about. The called, the language, presupposes that there is an external actor, that the Christian is the one acted upon, and not that the Christian is the one acting. But then in Romans 9, a chapter over, we are told that God chose a certain people to save and a certain people to not save, who are referred to as vessels of wrath. And Paul, in uh, Romans chapter 9, 11, says, But also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing, either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls. And so consequently, the predestination of salvation is based solely on the pleasures and hidden counsels of God's own will. It is not based on the choices of man or woman ahead of time, but instead it is based, as Paul says in verse 11, on him who called. And praise God that salvation is based on him who calls, and not our own selves. Because as John MacArthur says, if we could lose our salvation, then we would lose our salvation. And so... If there is a chance that we would not call upon God for salvation, we would not call upon God for salvation. And of course, listen to how Paul describes this in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. He says, You were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived, in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. And so, according to this text, we were dead. Our natures were completely depraved and wicked. And Romans 3.23 tells us that there are none who seek after God, and that all have fallen short of His glory. So based on these texts, it's not just that man has fallen short of God's glory, but that man doesn't even try to be worthy of God's glory. 
it's not just that we were bad, but that, but that we didn't even try to be good according to God's standards. It's not just that we were evil, but that we didn't even try to be holy. We didn't even seek after God. And if we didn't seek after God, that leaves only one solution for us to be saved. And that is for God to have sought after us. And then, of course, we have to ask, why didn't we seek after God? Well, because of what Paul tells us in Ephesians 2.1. Because we were dead. Dead men don't seek. Dead men don't do anything except lay on the ground and stink. That is the problem with the semi-Pelagian way of thinking here as it assumes that man is not totally depraved and that man can seek after God. Because if man can seek after God, how do we explain Romans 3.23 that clearly says man does not seek after God? And if man can seek after God, how do we explain (laughs) Ephesians 2 that tells us men are dead in their trespasses? And that's the, the problem, I think, with the classic life preserver analogy, and maybe you've had the misfortune of hearing it, but um, Vodi Bakum, I think, addresses this quite well, and this this refutation is from him, but in in the life preserver analogy, we are usually told, or rather the, the sinner is usually told, that the unregenerate man is drowning in this ocean of sin, and he's sinking down to the bottom, and by proclaiming the gospel, essentially what we are doing is we're throwing him a life preserver. And so if he'll just swim, and if he'll just swim and swim and swim to that life preserver, and then swim up to the top of the water, and then if he'll just grab on to that preserver, then he'll be saved. But the problem with this analogy is that dead men don't grab. It's that dead men don't swim. Dead men don't even tread water. Dead men sink. They're laying on the ocean floor, not moving a single muscle. And so the only way for him to be saved is not from a life preserver, but if someone completely revives him and gives him a new life. And that is what God has done for us. And so Ephesians 1, 4 through 6, which is the next part of this Ephesians of, uh, that we've been reading, Ephesians 1, 4 through 6, is a fantastic cross-reference to Romans 8, 28 through 30. Because it says, even as he, speaking of God, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him, in love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glory and grace, with which he has blessed us in the Beloved. So Ephesians chapter 1 interprets the foreknowledge of Romans 8 as choosing a people to be holy and blameless before him. So it is not mere foreknowledge. It is not mere knowledge. It is knowledge in action. It is, a, it is knowledge in action, which means it is cause. An intimate knowing, yeah. Exactly. Not talking about foreknowing the actions, but foreknowing the actual people. So those are two <clears throat> biblical rejections of that interpretation of Romans 8, 28 through 30. Um, another way in which this interpretation errors that I do want to touch on is that it errors philosophically. Um, and so namely, it assumes, this interpretation assumes that <clears throat> there is a disconnect between God's omniscience and God's omnipotence. While categorically we can separate God's omniscience from his omnipotence in in the sense of we can define them separately, we can talk about them separately, etc., 
philosophically and logically, we cannot. Omniscience means that God knows everything. And omnipotence means that God can do anything that is logically possible. So is it possible for God to do something that he did not know he was going to do beforehand? No, of course not. Is it possible for God to know that he is going to do something and then not actually do it? No. Or is it possible for something to exist without God knowing that it will exist? No. And then finally, is it possible for something to exist without God causing it to exist? No. So therefore, the only way a future can exist is if God causes it to exist. And God, in his omniscience, has always known that he will cause this future to exist. And so the existence of a future presupposes that not only God knew about this future, but that he also is the cause of the future's existence. And another way of saying it is that the postulation that a future exists presupposes that there is a future for God to know. And this means there is something that exists and not nothing that exists. And something can only exist if God causes it to. That's the whole thing of prophecy. That's right. that he was the cause. And so it's a very simple equation. Omniscience plus omnipotence equals sovereignty. God knew who would believe on Christ in the future. True. But God is also the cause of the future that will exist in which people will believe on Christ. So you cannot separate the existence of the future from God causing the existence of that future. And as such, you cannot separate belief in Christ from God causing it. And now, of course, the the nuances of how God is the cause of belief is fleshed out in other parts of Scripture, such as the, the Romans passage that we're reading here, but that is the gist. So if we believe in an all knowing, all powerful God, and we do, then by logical necessity, we must also believe in a sovereign God. And if we believe in a sovereign God, and we do, then by logical necessity, we must believe in God's sovereignty in salvation. Because God is either sovereign over everything, or he is sovereign over nothing. And so, either God is sovereign over salvation, or he is sovereign over nothing. And so the idea that this text is simply referring to God predestining to salvation those he knew would believe on Christ is incorrect on both exegetical and philosophical grounds. And this is also why, in the context of paterology or or theology proper, you cannot separate foreknowledge from predestination. For God to foreknow something means something has existed, does exist, or will exist, because God cannot foreknow what doesn't exist. And the only way something can exist is if God makes it exist. Therefore, in the context of paterology, which is the study of God the Father, Foreknowledge and predestination on a practical level are essentially synonyms. But now let's look back at Romans 8.30. After all of that, Romans chapter 8, verse 30, keeping all of this in mind, I want to emphasize how God is the one who must act first. Because Paul says that those God predestined, predestined to what? predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ. So that refers to what? That refers to imputation. That refers to being credited with the righteousness of Christ, which refers to salvation. And so these people who were predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ were called. And so God called those whom he predestined to salvation. What does Paul mean when he says called, though? What does it mean to be called? Well, he answers this in another of his epistles in 2 Thessalonians 2, 13 through 14, if you'll flip over there real quick. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13 through 14. And here he says, But we ought...
always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. To this he called you through our gospel, so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 13, <clears throat> Paul states that his audience was saved through belief in the truth. And then in verse 14, he says they were called to this truth, so to this salvation, through the gospel. What this means is that God predestines people to be conformed to the image of Christ, to be saved, and then the calling of the believer to salvation occurs through the hearing of the gospel. And hearing the preaching of the gospel, then, is how the believer is called. And this is crucial to understand, and Paul elaborates on this a few chapters later in Romans chapter 10, uh, verses 14 through 16, um, and if you'll flip there next, just because this has the, some meat in it. Uh, but Romans chapter 10, verses 14 through 16. And we'll actually go through uh, 17 on this. <clears throat> and here Paul says, How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. So faith comes from hearing. Hearing what? The word of Christ. So God calls believers to himself through the preaching of the word. And notice also that there is no qualification here of this type of preaching. <clears throat> As in, it does not say that faith comes from hearing really good preaching about the word of Christ. As in, teaching with good rhetoric and fancy words and good diction and lofty speech. It doesn't say that faith comes from hearing the word of God taught in a, a rich, deep Scottish accent like Sinclair Ferguson. <laughs> it definitely helps, yes. <laughs> yep. But it doesn't say that faith comes from hearing from a seminarian, from a man who has been trained in seminary. It doesn't say that faith comes from hearing from an old man or an old woman or a young man or a young woman a married person, an educated person, a rich person, a poor person, etc., you get the point. There is no qualification here. Faith comes from hearing the Word of God, period. And this is why you and I can rejoice in the fact that all we must do to lead someone to salvation is just proclaim the gospel. We don't need a fancy education or background or certain attributes. Now, certainly those may help, not discounting the, the significance of those, certainly. But as long as we know the true gospel, and as long as we actually proclaim it, then those whom God has predestined to receive salvation at that specific time and through that proclamation will be called to himself through that proclamation. And again, if we could prevent someone from being saved through a correct proclamation of the gospel, then to quote R.C. Sproul, we should all just sleep in tomorrow. <laughs> Because if we could prevent someone from being saved due to some kind of flaw in ourselves, then we would prevent someone from being saved. And so praise God then that someone's salvation is not dependent on the one who proclaims the gospel. Someone's salvation is purely, fully, and entirely dependent upon hearing the correct gospel. Because the one who saves us um, who get, or sorry, the, the one who gave us the gospel in Scripture is the one who also calls us to salvation through that gospel. And the one who calls us through the gospel is also the one who predestined us to salvation because he is also the one who foreknew us before the foundation of the earth. So it is all the same person. It is all the same God. The one who calls is also the one who who predestined. The one who predestined is also the one who foreknew. And the one who, um, who did all of those things is also the one who sent the person who proclaimed the gospel that we are now hearing. 
And so it all goes full circle. God foreknows, God predestines, God calls, God elects, God saves, God sends. God does everything. All on God. We have absolutely nothing to do with the salvific process. And to quote Jonathan Edwards, the only thing we contribute to our salvation is the sin that made it necessary. But with that said, um, talking about the call, we, we've unpacked the theology, we've pa- unpacked the background and everything else. So <clears throat> I do want to now make a distinction between two different types of calls. Um, we make a, uh, in theology, we make a distinction between two types of calls based on what we see in Scripture. There is a general call and an effectual call. Now, a general call refers to the command for all people to repent and believe on Christ. Because after all, it is not merely the the elect who are commanded to believe, but all people are commanded to believe. In Matthew 11, 28, Jesus commands, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And so there's no distinction here that is provided between those who will believe and those who will not believe. He makes a general call to all people. And the prophets are, are a great illustration here, or they illustrate this point repeatedly in their writings over and over and over again, calling all of Israel and Judah to repent. In Isaiah 45, 22, for example, Isaiah proclaims, Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. So there is a call for all people to repent and believe on Christ. And we must be careful, though, and and the general call is sometimes what can get confusing to some, but we must be careful to draw a distinction between what is indicative and what is imperative. What is imperative is not indicative. In other words, a command is not the same thing as a description. In this case, a command is not the same thing as a description of who actually will and will not do something or who actually can and cannot do something. These are two entirely different devices. If I command you to sprout wings and fly, that doesn't mean you can do that. A command does not cause, nor does it indicate ability. An imperative is not the same thing as an indicative. Now, there is also an effectual call. And an effectual call is what Paul references in Romans 10, 17, when he says, faith comes by hearing. So the effectual call is where the faith actually does come by hearing. Because we know that there are many instances of hearing the gospel that do not actually result in faith. In Jesus Christ. However, we know that based on these passages we read, that if someone has been predestined to salvation, there will be an instance of hearing the gospel that will result in faith in Jesus Christ. Now, that faith may not occur immediately upon hearing it. It may not even occur in the same week or maybe not even in the same decade. But if he has been elected to salvation that gospel message will implant itself in his mind and it will replay itself over and over and over and maybe he can distract himself with his, with his work, with his family life and fill his days with distractions but sometimes when his head hits the pillow and the world is silent and he has nothing else to think about, that gospel message and the reality of his soul replays in his head over and over and over again and eventually God will formally draw him to himself and he will replay that message until it makes its way from his mind into his soul and he is a new creation. wrestling with it. Yeah. 
Yeah. And that's what I mean by irresistible grace. It may not be immediate, but it will get you. God will draw you to himself. And so that's what we mean by this effectual call here. It is the call that is effectual. The call that is effective, as it were. So the effectual call then refers to when, through the proclamation of the gospel, God formally draws the unregenerate man or woman to himself, which results in regeneration by the Holy Spirit, which results in faith in Christ, which results in justification and adoption. And then as Paul says in Romans 8.30, those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. And so the effectual call is what precedes justification and regeneration and is affiliated with the proclamation of the gospel. And that's why there is a distinction between these two calls in theology because two are mentioned in Scripture. That you do have this call that is designed, or not designed, but you do have this call that is to a command to everybody to believe. But then you do have this other call through which people have faith and turn to Christ. And, of course, it is impossible to know which instance of gospel proclamation will lead to the effectual calling of someone who is predestined to salvation. And that is why we are not told to proclaim the gospel to just certain people or to proclaim the gospel just a certain number of times, like just proclaim it about three times and you're good. Um, Instead, we are told to proclaim the gospel to all people at all places at all times. It is not our business to know whom God has called to salvation. That is God's business. It is our business to proclaim the gospel and to leave the salvation of souls in God's hands. We are in the business of proclaiming, and God is in the business of saving. And so with all of this said now, if we look back to this our text in Romans 8, 28 through 30, and look at all the events that are tied to the calling of the believer. He says, For those who have been called, all things work together for their good. They are conformed to the image of Christ, which means they are now, they have the image of Christ. They have been clothed in his righteousness. They have been washed in his blood. Christ is now the mediator between them and God, that when God looks at them, he sees the beloved picture of his son, Jesus Christ. So for those who have been called, they are conformed to the image of Christ. They are firstborn among many brothers. They have been justified and they will be glorified. And when we take this together, we know that to be called then, to be effectually drawn to Christ, means to inherit all of these other statuses. Justification, glorification, sanctification, both definitive and progressive. You have adoption and so on, and propitiation, expiation, etc., etc. And and that's why earlier, way back at at the start um, of this message, I mentioned that the word called is essentially a summary of the gospel because this little word packs a huge punch. Um, Indeed, it it has enough in here for me to ramble almost 40 minutes about it. And, And indeed, doubtless, we could spend even more time talking about this and just talking about this concept of a Christian being called. And so when you think of this word or when you see this word, when you see Christians described as called in the scripture, remember all of these things that are associated with it. Remember all of the glorious truths that exist within this one word. To be called means to be acted upon by God. It means to be chosen by him before the foundation of the earth, before time began. It means to be loved by God before the foundations of this entire world. And I have to throw this quote in here by uh, Jihardis Vo, who, who stated that, quote, the best proof that God will never cease to love us lies in that he never began, end quote. And so if you just ruminate on that for, for a bit, that God loved you before the foundation of the world, before time even was a thing, before time even existed, which means that God's love for his people is not dependent on time. 
there was never any instance in time where God did not love you. He has always loved you. And because his love for you is not dependent on time, because his love for you has always existed, it is impossible for his love for you to cease existing. God cannot cease loving his people because there was never a time when he did not love his people. The love he has for his people is bound up with eternity itself. And that love for them was fully manifested at the death and resurrection of his son and then practically manifested when he called us to himself. And so now, with, with that entire backdrop and foundation behind us, if we turn back to James 1, and we read this phrase again, to those who are called, this has a much louder and better and more infinite ring to it. To those who are eternally loved by God, to those who are justified, to those who are adopted into God's family, to those who are sons and daughters of the Most High God, that is what it means for his audience to be called. And then the next part of the sentence tells us, beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ. And that is a summary of what we have already read in Romans and Ephesians and Corinthians and Thessalonians, that God chose to love a certain people before the foundations of the world. And those people he chose are Christ. And this is exactly what Christ says in John chapter 6, 37 through 40. And I'll read that for you here where Jesus says, all that the father gives me will come to me and whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. So all who God gives Christ will come to him. There is no question. All who the Father gives to His Son will come to His Son. There's not a chance that they won't. They will come to Him. And then those who do come to Him, Jesus says He will never cast out. That's eternal security. Never, never, ever. Never, never, ever. Jesus will never cast them out. And so in other words... All that the Father has chosen, all that He has foreknown, all that the Father gives to Christ will never be cast out from the kingdom of heaven. Can can I interject also? Yes, sir. John 6, 37 through 40. And the church is to all, right? Mm -hmm. Some of the disciples are hard hearts. Yeah. And then it says, verse 37 through 40, and he says, Well, then, preach to all of them. No one. Preach to everybody. Yeah. Exactly. And that's exactly along with the, the Great Commission as well. Because Jesus, again, he knew who would and wouldn't. And yet his parting words to the apostles were preach to everybody. Proclaim the gospel to all the ends of the earth. And so in 38, Jesus says, For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that God has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life. And I will raise him up on the last day. And so again, all who God has foreknown, he predestined, and all that God has given to the Son will come to the Son, and all who come to the Son will never be cast out from the kingdom of heaven. And therefore, if we have salvation, then the entire reason for our existence is to be given to Christ. We have been kept by God, we have been saved by God, so that we may be given to Christ. We are His workmanship, instruments of righteousness, And Christ, our beloved, has lived for us. He has died for us. He has ransomed us. And then God has called us that we may live together with Christ for all eternity. And so this is the significance of what it means to be called. That this love love that God has for us, that this love that he has exhibited from the foundations of the world that has never started but has always been, 
that this love has been practically manifested at the day that we were called, on the day that we were called and we exhibited faith in him and in his son for salvation. And so whenever we read these words and whenever we see this in scripture, we have to remember all the components of salvation that are tied up with this, that to be called, this is just one of the last steps of the salvific process. It is built upon all of these other actions that God has already done. So by the time this effectual call occurs in our lives, God has already done all the work. God's done the foreknowing. He's done the predestining. He's done the saving. He's done all of the the miraculous providential workings of history to build up to the salvation of mankind through the death and burial and resurrection of his son. He has done all of these things. And so by the time we have been effectually called, we are building upon millennia and years and years and thousands and hundreds of years of God's workmanship so that we may be saved. And so this is just an incredible thing to remember. And that is what Jude is calling his audience here, that they are called. And so this significance is not lost upon him. And that's how he begins this epistle before he starts calling them to go back to the way on which they should go, to go back to the true gospel. Because he's reminding them, remember the gospel that saved you. Remember the truth of salvation. Remember the things that God has done for you. Remember that you have been called. Remember that you have been loved by God, that you have been foreknown by God, that you have been predestined by God, that you have been called by God. Remember that you are beloved in God and that you are kept for Christ. Remember these things and remember these things so that you don't stray from them. Because the next part of Jude is him urging them to turn away from the false doctrine that they've been inundated with. Because, and that's the message that we have to remember for ourselves as well. That when we are tempted to stray, when we are tempted to stray to a wayward doctrine, when we are tempted to stray to the perils of fear or temptation or, or what have you, when we are tempted to go away from the faith, remember that we have been called to such a great salvation and remember the love that God has shown to us and remember that we are being kept for Jesus Christ. And I'll close this in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we, we thank you for this, this significant reality that there is no words in the human language that can even accurately represent how important and how significant these realities are. And Father, we, we understand that while these words may be small, the reality and the content that is packed within them is so insurmountable that, again, that we just can't even begin to accurately describe how crucial and important these things are. And so, Father, we ask that you weigh our souls down and our consciences down with these realities and that you fill our hearts and our souls with this indescribable joy. And we ask that you give us these the circumstantial contentment in all scenarios and all circumstances because we remember these theological realities and these salvific realities and we remember all of these things that you have done for us through your son Jesus Christ and we remember that before time even began you were thinking of us and that we were in your mind and father we we ask that this be weighed down upon us and just be another reminder to us that this life is so temporary and that this life is so fragile and fickle and fading away and may we remember that this is just nothing but the blink of an eye in the in the time span of eternity and that this is nothing but a grain of sand on the overall shore of eternity and may we remember that we have this eternity to spend with you and so may this for our fleeting lives and for all of the years that you have given us, may we remember these truths and may we obey you and may we follow you and may we spend the short time that you have given us in this life, may we spend these years proclaiming your gospel to all people so that they may be called to salvation by your providence and by your sovereignty and grace and may we call on on everyone to repent and believe on Christ but may we also continue to mortify our flesh and may we continue to obey and to follow you And we ask that you implant and firmly imprint these realities upon our hearts, upon our minds, upon our souls, upon our consciousness, 
and may this stir our affections for you. And we ask these things in the name of your Son. Amen.